What I'm going to talk about today is, is a lot of my personal opinion uh, based on years of military service, uh, based on uh, pursuit of a PhD right now where I'm doing a lot of study on, on what I believe to be a social issue, um, uh, radical Islamic movements online via social media, uh, and then is also, also based on a, a bunch of work that we do. Um, and so, disclaimer, we do do a lot of work with the, with the government, uh, and so that uh, unsuccessful approach at how we've been doing things in this space is going to inform a lot of my opinions. Um, and I, I hope this is a discussion that starts with a bunch of people in this room going forward, and that this, this can snowball into something that's beyond just a, a talk at DEF CON. So, go ahead. Um, so why Twitter, why ISIL, and why tech? The first thing, uh, why Twitter? I think I could just as easily kind of bend the technical social social media domain into five or six other spaces right now. Uh, but first of all, Twitter right now, it's a really important space for this conversation that's happening. Um, it's important because of uh, how prevalent it is, how free it is, everywhere it is. All you need is uh, 140 characters and a free ISP. Uh, these two pictures I've got up here, one on the on the left of the screen is a target that's put on Jack Dorsey's head after Twitter starts earlier this year kind of deleting accounts in mass um, that are violating you know Twitter's terms of service and, and, uh, and policies. Um, the, the figure on the right is something that I came across literally in the last couple days, hosted by a firefighter in Fairfax, Virginia, right outside of D.C. So right here on our, 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 on our home, and I think that that's not a surprise to anybody. But if, if anybody can take a close look at that picture on the right, and uh, anybody point out where, where they see a Twitter handle? Bottom of the rifle, right? So uh, it's important. They're using these mediums to spread information, and not just pictures, and not just uh, not just fun little images and pictures. They're using it to communicate in a very sophisticated way. So it's really, really, really important. Next. And the next thing is, it's really, really, really hard. Uh, it's really, really hard for us to figure this space out uh, because it changes literally by the day. Uh, this was something that was in the news recently, and we've got this whole selfie phenomenon. Uh, well, somebody posted a selfie in the Middle East, and then within 20 hours later, because they didn't have a good set, good feeling on, on privacy policies, uh, U.S. military launched, launched aircraft and ended up taking this individual out because of a selfie. Immediately after that, and all the all the forums and online, the, what we call TTPs, so methods, how people are using these things, changed immediately to the point of tell everybody if they have uh, if they're using Twitter to post coordinates information, and we find you, that's a violation of law in the Islamic State, and you will be persecuted accordingly. So, my graphic on the bottom. This is uh, this is based on a little bit more than opinion. This is based on a lot of research. What's happening in this in this uh, space right now is you're, you're I'm going to go through some some research projects that'll give you some fancy graphics, and we'll talk about different populations within this domain. But there's a population of really bad guys, and then there's a huge population of kind of moderates or people who are trying to engage in this conversation. And that conversation is starting literally right in front of us on Twitter, and that's the little left side of the, the graphic with a little uh, little Twitter icon. And then quickly, after two or three messages where somebody will like or follow or do one of those really easy, easy to measure metrics, they'll go to direct messaging, and they'll start to talk to each other uh, directly. And that's another layer of kind of anonymity and another challenge for us to have any idea what's going on. Um, Immediately after that, they're pivoting into some really, really high-end encryption technology, which, for all intents and purposes, anybody who's paying attention and wants to get engaged in the space is completely blind on. So this part of, of my talk today and my ask of you guys to have a conversation and paying attention to this going forward is about the first part of this graphic, of the conversations that are being had right in front of us. I'm not interested in talking about all the, all the encryption and, you know, the Snowden and all that other stuff. I'm saying that we need to pay attention to the open part of this conversation before it gets to that, that crazy hard part. So why ISIL? Uh, why am I talking about ISIL at DEF CON in the SE Village? Uh, 
Uh, I think that this is no longer a, a government problem. I think it's no longer a United Nations security problem. I think this is our problem. Um, you know, I'm, I uniquely spend a bunch of time in the military and do a bunch of government work, but I'm literally not even pursuing any more of this, this type of work in the government space because we're bad at it. And I don't think that we can solve it. I think that we need to solve it. Um, it's a people problem. And we have examples now of how crappy we are as a big, huge bureaucracy with unlimited resources and having no effects. Uh, some examples of that. So, Shami Witness. I'm going to talk to you about three research reports, and all three of them talked about this guy's the baddest guy. He's the most influential, you know, loudest. Why? Because he's got a lot of followers and he tweets all the time. You know what he was? He was like a banker in India, just kind of having fun. Um, uh, the next one uh, happened earlier this year on U.S. Central Command's Twitter account, Cyber Caliphate. So it was branded as the cyber arm of the Islamic State Caliphate, and that's what we thought for a couple months. So big bad U.S. national security, completely ineffective, spins up on, oh no, a cyber caliphate. And they have actually done a bunch of other kind of published military family members and whatnot. Turns out within the last couple weeks that we've learned that it's probably some, you know, non-state kind of uh, group may be sponsored by Russia. Who knows? Uh, but the ambiguity around this space and how other brands are now starting to jump on this Islamic State kind of sled, it's a big problem. Um, the next one is an example in the bottom right-hand corner of how ISIL, uh, ISIS, whatever you want to refer to it, is using this command and control space very effectively and publishing out, hey, we just did this great thing for the local communities in Mosul. And they're publishing it, so they're communicating there. This space is important, and it's everybody's problem. So why tech? Uh, I'm going to spend a lot of time uh, in the next half hour talking about this is a human problem and, and people need to be solving stuff. But this space, is the volume is so big and so fast, we obviously need to use technology. So this is a super fancy graphic uh, put out by one of the preeminent experts in this space, J.M. Berger. He's out of Boston. He's all over the news when it comes to this. But, like, what the hell is this picture? I mean, what can, what can you do with this? Uh, what can we do with this in real time? Um, you know, there's a ton of smart people in here that understand network diagrams and understand kind of exploiting or, or understanding and looking at dynamics of people. But if we're trying to engage in a conversation in real time that's happening 24-7, this thing's borderline useless. Uh, and these are all the things that are happening, and these are the ways that people are trying to deal with this space. So this is a people problem, but we got to use tech because it's so big. So, I, I was sitting in yesterday. Anybody in yesterday for Michelle's talk? Yeah. So I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm watching her. You know, she's way smarter than I am on some of the reasons people do things. And these are like resonating with me. Each one she's talking, I'm like, yep, this is one of our issues on this problem. Yep, this one is. Yep, this one is. So we make the same mistakes over and over. Uh, we always take the shortcut. That's what we've been doing on this, this internet thing for ISIS and before ISIS Al-Qaeda. We just keep doing the same thing. We think if we tweet and we, we have, have somebody that has 2,000 followers that we're good at it. Uh, we keep doing the same thing, the same thing. Why? Because we have a tendency to do it. Uh, as decisions increase in complexity, we don't get better at them. Um, this has got to be one of the most historically complex issues in the history of mankind. You've got freedom of religion issues. You've got freedom of speech issues. You've got anonymity. You've got privacy. Uh, you've got Fourth Amendment. You've got international issues. I mean, it doesn't get much more complex than that. And that's, I mean, that's a reality. Um, and we hate uncertainty. Same thing. All those complexity issues, there's, there's nothing certain about this environment other than that the results we're getting at our current approach are completely ineffective. And then I'm going to come back to the fourth point uh, that Michelle made, which is everybody uh, likely can be nudged. So we'll talk about that later.
All right, so I'm going to talk about a couple research articles, and this, these are kind of some of the state-of-the-art people in the last, like, 12 months that is talking about how we're engaging in this space, how effective we are, uh, what are some models that we can look at to affect it. This one was put out uh, in early 2014. This is the oldest one. Uh, but one of the earliest that went in and looked just at Twitter and YouTube uh, by an organization called Voxpol out of Europe, Violent Online, Violent Online Extremism, funded by a, a grant from the European Union. A bunch of people from uh, Dublin University. And um, they went in and analyzed, not really understanding what they were going to do in their research. They just went and collected a bunch of data and classified it afterwards. So this uh, fancy graphic, um, post, post facto, they collected probably like 2 million tweets uh, over, over two months and then took like six months to hypothesize about it and talk about it and get peer reviews and uh, broke that, that data into four distinct groups. Um, and, they, and I won't read it, but it ended up with 2 million or so tweets broken into 672 users, 650, 670, something like that, users that were categorized according to these four categories. And the big takeaway uh, that, I, that I hope kind of maybe gets stuck in your mind as I'm talking for the next couple minutes is that big blue group, okay? That big blue group is the, is the, the group uh, or a population, and you can extrapolate this graphic into almost any demographic, whether it's a thousand or a hundred thousand, and that's a pretty accurate picture of kind of how these factions are breaking out, meaning that there's like a 60% contingent in the middle of all these conversations, and we need to fight better to make that 60%, 80%, and really push out from the inside the moderate conversations so people are making smart decisions. Next, uh, the Sufan Group, preeminent group that does research in this space, uh, published a big report late last year, uh, so less than a year ago, I think December of or November of 2014, and these are got literally some of the best in the world on this topic and this problem set, and their most fancy graphic is the tweets per day. I mean, thanks, right? What, what are we doing five years into it? Um, and the, the, the upper right-hand corner is, oh, go delete an account. Oh, shut that account. And in the same amount of time, they get a new one out saying, hey, I just got deleted. Please share my stuff and, and give me a new one. Uh, and they're putting out and publishing via Twitter very, very, very high-end uh, marketing information materials, and they're telling very, very compelling stories that you and I might not understand from our perspective, but that really resonate back with that blue blob on the last uh, last slide, that moderate population of, hey man, I'm having a rough day, I want a job, I want to get paid, I want to go travel, I want to go experience something, I want to get married, you know, that's all coming out in very, very fancy, fancy marketing stuff, and the only way people are learning about it is through the hashtag ISIS. Okay, the third one. Uh, this is hands down uh, the most informative, most advanced look at how this space is being used uh, by J.M. Berger and uh, Jonathan Morgan, published in March of this year. Uh, after three months of research from September to December of last year. Uh, and it's kind of cool that we're cutting down the time penalty on when we're looking at these things to when you're, you're getting information out. So now we're down from like six to nine months, and now we're only down to three, right? So uh, looked at, now we're not looking at 650. We're looking at tens of thousands. These guys looked at uh, like in the 17, 18 million tweets, time frame, or, or uh, uh, data inputs and narrowed it into and looked at around 40,000 uh, 40, Twitter handles um, and actually had some pretty good metrics in how they're analyzing and how they're filtering, but very similar demographic, you know, that, that population output. Most advanced, three months late, same outputs. Cool social network diagrams. They look really great on slides. They look really great when these guys go to Capitol Hill and testify before every committee and uh, go to Google Ideas and get more money to do more kind of countering violent extremism research. Uh, but we're just not affecting. We're just not affecting the space in real time. 
So I'm uh, I'm really really sick of looking at the news every three or four days and seeing this explosion here and then ISIS taking credit for it via social media via Twitter. And so you know the whole uh, when you say something with all due respect and then but and you kind of don't don't mean the respect. I actually really mean that with all due respect to those current researchers and and uh, with, with with these tactics that are happening right now. I really do mean that with all due respect uh, but but it's not good enough because we're not winning we're not kind of moving the needle um, these guys the researchers and then these tactics right now in a really small isolated bubble bubble are actually probably pretty good uh, but it's not strategic it's very immediate it's very near term so upper left hand corner uh, jester probably everybody in this audience is pretty familiar with the jester idea uh, man, this this Twitter handle and 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 person has been around for years uh, and super passionate about doing something in the space. There's probably people in this room that that knows that individual, uh, but again, pretty effective on a on a local level. But he's going to be employed for the next 20 years if we don't do anything different. Uh, bottom left hand corner, Lucky Troll Club. Again, they're going to be employed for the next 10 years if we don't do anything different. Identifying ISIS accounts and shutting them down. Uh, right hand corner. Um, I'm not. I, I. I don't mean the respect part of. With all due respect on this one, I think that this has been a pathetic attempt at doing anything. Um, it's a taxpayer funded initiative with the Department of State. And as Jason said before, you don't don't send. A, uh, don't don't portray to be a plumber if you're not a plumber. These guys are plumbers trying to be a, a communication arm in my mind. Um, very, very poorly affected. Probably not even, not even just not a positive effect on the space, but it's probably having a negative effect in the space. Um, but current tactics not getting results. So when we met Chris a couple years ago. Uh, and we started working with him and Michelle and pulling them into environments that they probably hadn't spent a bunch of time in doing kind of national security type stuff. And he's like, dude, don't say that. I'm not supposed to be doing that. You know, I'm very uncomfortable. And we talked to him about social engineering and how we do that, how we, how we apply the social engineering, building rapport and influence uh, in the social media online environment. And we would ask him to do his, his disk profiling and then analyze online stuff in the context of social and digital. And we learned that it's very challenging to do that. But at the end of the day, why am I talking about research? And why am I about to talk about some theories that we can approach this space in? Because it's all about influence. It's all about communication. It's all about influence at the time that those, those moderates are talking to the influencers. And we're not participating. We're looking at it after the fact when they move from a blue to a yellow. So, here's my, uh, my, my sleepless passion right now. I'm, I'm a couple years into a PhD program in criminal justice. I'm a technology guy at, at heart, and I wanted a, a completely fresh start, so now I'm reading all this historical stuff on criminal justice and whatnot. And uh, one of my, my bins is to, to understand why these bad guys are communicating the way they do and why they're so effective. And how can I explain that to those around me in a way that, that, that will encourage them to help? So, social learning theory, it's a, that's not just in the, because we're in the SE village, there's a very historical construct to understand why bad guys do bad things and how they learn to be bad. Social learning theory. Routine activities theory is what I believe is a really good construct to measure that conversation in. Uh, and I'll talk about both that. But at the end of the day, I'm trying to get people to understand the criminological behaviors so that we can impact the conversation in real time, not just come up with a fancy network diagram about it three months later. So uh, this is the boring part, but, but I think important. This has been around since the 70s. Uh, Albert Bandura, a Stanford professor, starts to talk about why do people learn? How do they learn? And can you learn via you know, hands-on or via association? Um, and, and there's been a lot of research that says, heck yeah, you can learn through associations, and heck yeah, you can learn through virtual means. So a ton of research which statistically says that you can learn bad behaviors just by watching and just by watching.
watching others. Uh, and that's how it happens most of the time. So an update on that into to kind of mo more modern times, Ron Akers, University of Florida, he came up with another really good way to extrapolate uh, theory into uh, structured equation modeling so we can throw it, into, uh, throw it into a statistical program and come up with good ideas about how to measure. And it, and it has to do with four things. Definitions. So coming into a conversation, what do you think is good and bad? What is your understanding of good and bad in the world? Uh, differential um, associations. Who are you already kind of aligned with before you start to have conversations? Uh, differential uh, imitations, or I'm sorry, differential reinforcements. So via proxy, via hands away, uh, one hand away, are you watching somebody take an action and then see them be rewarded or punished? Very simple. If they're rewarded, they're going to think it's a good idea. If they see said individuals get punished, they're probably going to take a step away. And then the last thing is imitation. So after some of those things happen, they start to imitate. And you don't even know it. It's subconscious learning. Social learning theory. So... Social learning theory is happening at the individual level, from one to one. Uh, one to one based on other things around you. Routine activities theory is kind of taking a step out at the 40,000 foot level and looking at you know, where crime happens. Uh, you've got a bad guy. You've got somebody who can be influenced, so somebody who's a potential bad guy, or in my case, a potential not bad guy that we can talk to. And then in that, that third instance, those two are fact. We got bad guys and we got potential bad guys, or hopefully potential not bad guys. The third thing is what we can control is lack of an authority figure. If there's not a good mom tapping on the shoulder of a potential person saying don't do this, if there's not an effective department Department of State conversation, which is completely ineffective, participating in that conversation, we don't have a shot, and this scenario plays out every time. So, going forward, uh, and this, this slide's pretty busy, uh, but I just wanted to, to throw this up here, and it is a busy slide, to, to let you know in my you know, research, tying together a lot of modern, updated things and measuring digital crime and digital personal learning. You know, how can I measure uh, somebody in their basement watching 12 hours of YouTube videos? How can I measure the effectiveness of that individual learning in that environment? There's some good data out there that says I can't, and that's a personal learning environment. Uh, how can I measure routine activities theory in today's kind of, you know, digital age where every data is dynamic and whatnot? There's some good stuff out there. And, and uh, I put some kind of layman's terms on who the bad guys are, who the subtle, suitable targets are, and what the capable guardian could be. And I'm arguing that this community could ultimately provide that capable guardian uh, uh, lever. Next. So... Uh, what to do about it, you know? Uh, what to do about it. Super challenging. People will keep doing bad things. Uh, we keep doing the same mistakes. Let's recognize first that this is a really, really like multi-dimensional problem, very dynamic, uh, and trying to break it down into really simple before we get to maybe some of the fun stuff, which is we're trying to solve this with some tech. Um, go ahead. Just do the build. Um, and so we've got said Twitter users. Jane Berger says there's somewhere between 40,000 and 90 uh, we've got suitable targets, which there's hundreds of thousands of them. And then we've got absolutely a lack of authority figure because we keep whack a mole and not doing anything. And I'm saying that could be our intervention point at the point of influence, right in the middle of this Venn diagram. So I'm hoping this conversation starts today about acting at that point of influence. One, by finding it first, because that's a really hard thing. And then two, by having a ready response at that point of information. Uh, uh, point of intervention based on social learning theory and influence and communication based on doing your research and pretexting and having an idea of what to say and when to say it. Go ahead. Uh, so, how do we find that first digital point? Well, we can find it and talk about it for six months or four months afterwards and your, your Twitter handle is on version 153. Uh, when you analyzed it, it was on 73 and they just keep going number to number and number and advancing. Uh, let's, we gotta find it in real time. We gotta look at it in real time so we can respond in real time. 
so here's where we talk about the human enabled machine assisted. Um, I'm, I'm here to tell you that we're spending tens of millions of dollars on this problem right now. We're procuring technology that is like crazy supercomputer. Uh, we're paying companies in Silicon Valley millions of dollars per year to throw a really fancy social network analysis and social media analytics at it. Uh, and it's all big data approach. And uh, we're trying to say now via smart data, via real time, via kind of decentralized approach, human enabled machine assisted. Good. So that, that really complex problem of radicalization, I don't, I don't claim to have all the variables. I just know that it's very complex. I know I need other people to, to help me out with that aspect of how to communicate and when to communicate it. Uh, in both sides of the spectrum, people have really loud varying opinions of, hey, I can buy Palantir and throw Palantir at it, and it's going to needle in a haystack. We're good to go, sir, and move on. Uh, there's also some that say, don't do tech. We got to build roads, and we got to build schools, and we got to do education, and we got to get jobs, you know, just via the human aspect. And uh, it's somewhere in between. We got to be in the real time fight. But I would lar uh, argue largely this is more of a people, people problem. So, just like Robocop, right? Uh, somewhere in between, Robocop. Um, still pretty cool, and we're going to talk a little bit about the process in a, in a free freeware script, but I would argue that today, the bigger picture, the bigger takeaway, is the, in what I would call kind of revolutionary in today, today's time, is the fact that we could influence this space. We, in this room, in this community, and everybody that leaves here that talks to 15 people, and we go from, you know, one to N, that's the big deal coming out of here. Um, and so, find the accounts now and then be ready with an informed approach to, to, to have that conversation and be that voice of reason and that authority figure. <clears throat> so, how do we do that in real time and be ready to respond? It is actually a pretty simple process. Anybody could go you know, on your phones right now and take two seconds and start to find things. But at volume, super tedious. Super tedious. So, uh, instead of the millions of dollars, instead, instead of... Capitol Hill, and instead of Congress, and instead of United Nations, let's look at freeware, let's look at people, let's look at ideas, that's what this whole community does so, so well. This is why I've got Giannis up here. Here's where it starts to get complex. Uh, and this all this all came to be one one day in the office when I'm opining about you know my opinions on all this stuff, and he's sitting there not saying a word, just looking at me like, shut up and move on because I talk too much about it. But he he starts to put math to this problem, and uh, so this is a machine learning approach at how we classify this this information and spit it out relatively simply, and and this is uh, a very simple approach at how you classify something according to other events. So the probability of something happening, B, dependent on a variable A. And, and not to get into the math of it, but the critical takeaway here is uh, Naive Bayes is very simple, it's very adaptable, it's iterative, and relatively simple to understand the results on. And that's what, th that's what this uh, process that we're about to talk through is built on. So how are we doing it? Uh, Night base depends on establishing a baseline library of data from the same domain that we're about to go measure. So we go out and get a couple hundred, and uh, similar to those other other research theories that say, human, go go uh, go measure this. So we do that. We go out uh, and we build a training set. That's our baseline classifier. That's not dependent on ones and zeros and potential errors. That's based on us having worked in the space for the last 10 years, saying this attribute gives me a pretty good probability that this account is a nice little account. So we build our training library, first step. Next step is that we process this stuff and we take it in, and as, as we probably all know in this group, that raw text that comes out of Twitter, there's a lot of crap in there that's not relevant to kind of the intent and the content and what some people would call sentiment. So we recode it into something that can be measured the same way every, every time to have a pretty good probability going back to that, that math equation that 
what we think our baseline is. I compare it to these new variables, and now I'm going to have a pretty good uh, uh, guesstimate from an automated standpoint at volume of this account is, is that bad guy. I want to be paying attention to the conversations he's having. Um, and, and we're training and we're retraining that baseline classifier data because our outputs of this, of this uh, piece of software and script is only as good as our baseline library. So after we get our baseline library, uh, we're going out, pulling, pulling accounts, uh, interpreting them according to that baseline library, and retraining it and retraining it such that there's uh, uh, an association of set account. Yep, this is a bad guy. What's my percentage classification of, of, uh, of likelihood so I can potentially engage in that and also maybe look like a bad guy but not with, uh, with again, a high probability. And we're pulling this via free API, free Twitter API, free inputs. Not tens of millions, not any millions. It's people doing work with freeware. And after that is, is kind of where today is going to stop. There's a lot of different things that we could do to take action on an individual level when you're, instead of you know donating some time to the local community, maybe donate some time on this stuff where there's a whole bunch of ways that social issues people can impact the space. And, and that's part of the things I'll talk about at the end, but engaging with that in a social engineering influential way. So that was the process, and then we started to build. Uh, Stick It Learn, it's a Python language machine learning library. Uh, a lot of historics on, on effective use of this build and effective use of, of uh, interpreting data with high levels of probability. Um, slowly parsing Twitter, what is it, every six seconds? We can, we can interpret an account every six seconds. So if I extrapolate that into what some of the best have said, I've got a 100,000 plus or minus 50,000, that's only a couple weeks. A couple weeks of work on a local CPU where we can establish that baseline library. So we're talking even with low processing power and a moderate approach of having a good idea of what's going on in this space. And, and I keep emphasizing this, that it's free. And I, I say this from, I got out of the military in like 2008 and we wanted to, I'm a software guy, we wanted to build the next best social media analytics tool. And we tried for a couple years and learned that we were you know, miserably behind what was state of the art and whatnot. And uh, so I've come full circle on solving, solving problems in this space is about tradecraft and it's about a creative approach and it's about using a whole bunch of different things to do it, to, to uh, uh, kind of meet your objective. And so this approach, this code, this uh, information is free. It just takes people that are passionate about it with some time. I'm not so great at like some of the specifics of what the output of the script is, Giannis is, and, and we'll be around after this to talk specifics if you're interested in some of the code writing. But the, the takeaway on this is that this freeware put together in a couple months based on a framework that we developed based on historical criminological theories is accurate somewhere between 90 and 98%. Uh, and it gives you that feedback in real time. So it's really enabling the human with machine to be effective at a pretty high rate. And so here's uh, some quick examples from the data set that we've just run and pulled. And, and uh, I said to, to Giannis, like, hey, this is going to be cool, and we'll, we maybe want to do some live demos, but I'm worried about the network and worried about getting hacked, but we got to have tangible stuff here. And uh, one kind of important kind of cool note on uh, there's obviously images associated with what we think and see on the news, um, but we were really happy to see actually the, the one in the bottom left, which was a uh, uh, non ISO account, which was ultimately a parody. And that thing was able to see it because of that, that 90% uh, accuracy thing. So this is a data set of, you know, in the hundreds, and we're pulling down uh, handles in groups of 20 to 25, operating between 90 and 100% uh, accuracy. So, coming kind of towards the end, and, and what I, I'm, I'm sick of being in a position of just talking about the problems and looking at the diagram, so like, what could we do? Uh, 
all the data that, and examples that we've done to date have been on English language. Um, so we could start to classify stuff in foreign language. Um, we could have different classification inside of just, you know, staying at the 30,000 foot level of this is an ISO account. And we could start to talk about things like, hey, this is a recruiter. Hey, this is a fundraiser. Hey, this is a travel and logistics uh, handle that would better inform our communication approach going forward. Um, we could build our library from, you know, several hundred to several thousand. So, so accuracy is not between 90 and 100. It's between, you know, 98 and 100 um, with time. And we could do this kind of together. Uh, but we could have a decentralized response arm so that everybody's pulling from the same library and the same baseline and responding in the same way and adding to it and learning. And we're not constrained by bureaucracy and government and all that other stuff. Um, and we could engage in that conversation and kind of be that intervention point from a built-upon social learning theory construct where we're communicating, understanding, associations, reinforcement, definitions of what's good and bad, challenges, and we could hopefully get them to imitate alternate behavior instead of that little yellow bubble on, the, on that first graphic. So, you know, when, when Chris and I were talking about this and I came out here and I'm on my, you know, what I want to spend my time talking and, and bothering you all about as you get to the, the fun part of the SC Village with, with Had and Aggie and the guy before me. And this is a little bit of, of my soapbox on something I've been working for a number of years with high frustration levels of I would love to get this community involved. I know there's so many people here who want to solve problems. You hear everybody talking about I'm a good hacker and I want to do good. This, to me, is, is one of the biggest kind of pandemics that we have that is like been around so long we're almost complacent. Um, and so I'm hoping that people can see this in different fashions and you guys can talk about it a little bit and uh, come research with us. Um, and then going back to Michelle yesterday, everybody can be nudged. So if you got a couple spare, spare uh, jewels of energy, come wasted on this problem. And uh, we'll be around. I'm happy to take questions. Um, and Giannis will be around to answer the hard questions on the, the software. But I appreciate you guys listening to this topic in this venue. Uh, again, I know it's an anomaly, but I've been falling on Chris's ear for like years to, to give me 30 minutes in the room. And uh, he finally relented. So thanks. Yeah. There's this movement I see where someone in Japan wanted to rebrand the ISIL hashtag with ISIL chan and anime characters and kind of do that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I have. Yeah, the, the question was that he's seen a movement in Japan where they rebranded rebranded some of the ISIL stuff with ISIL or ISIL Chan hashtag, and uh, if if I'm not mistaken on that, it backfired pretty quickly. Um, yeah, and so that that's kind of a, um, it's a great question because it's one of the points I'm trying to make, which is there's so many little factions of people trying to do this that you know in the tactical they're probably effective for a couple days and get trending and stuff, but in the aggregate it's not we're not doing anything. Yeah, in the back. Uh, so the question was, uh, we talked about how we find them, but when we find them, what do we do about them? Um, so I wanted to focus today on us kind of changing our mind frame of instead of looking at the research three months after the fact and figuring out what to do, and when you don't even have a, chan have a chance to have a conversation, and my, my kind of last bit was, here's a tool to go find them in real time, and that next kind of global step of taking
taking action according to principles that everybody in this room is interested just by definition of being an SE village understanding that this is a sophisticated conversation of influence and so that taking action part is about understanding that people learn according to definitions reinforcements imitations and you have to build rapport and you have to pay attention to rapport and influence so what do you do go have a conversation from your perspective that counters the only one that these folks are hearing right now which is we're awesome and we're going to pay you a job and we're going to pay you for the first time in five years we're going to give you a life we're going to give you a purpose just go have a conversation that and it's to me first step is it's literally as simple as that yeah so to follow up on sort of that interplay so let's say i'm, I'm using your algorithm i've identified you know, an iso recruiter let's say mm -hmm. I, I assume you're not suggesting that you want me to you know just mention him the and him like hey buddy stop I, i'm assuming your idea is more take a look at who he's getting the yeah, yeah that's exactly right going. that's exactly yeah. right the question was okay so i've identified a, a recruiter we're not suggesting that you go have a conversation and try to change the recruiter's mind. I'm suggesting that you go pay attention to who the recruiter's talking to and have that conversation in real time with him before it transitions from an open kind of bland recruitment of, you know, envision them sitting at the corner and coming by the recruiting station. As soon as they do that and they take the guy inside and have the conversation in the office, we're gone. We don't have a chance at it. I'm saying come stand at the recruiting station and be the other, the other person on the shoulder. Yeah. 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 Awesome question, and that's actually a point I wanted to make. So there's uh, Twitter's a business, right? They're in business, and there's there's a lot of recent things that, that are saying like Twitter needs to do more, and Facebook needs to do more. No, they don't. I mean, it, it, they get so much pressure, and, and their stock price is going to the tubes right now. And part of it could be because they get pressure on this topic right now. And so I know I haven't personally talked to Twitter, but I know very influential people in our national security apparatus have sat down with Jack Dorsey and had this conversation. And it's not a Twitter issue. It's a people issue. Twitter, Twitter can't staff the volume of stuff that we're talking about here and run a business. Yes, sir. Since you require military, what area of military? Uh, Navy, submarines. So you have a military mindset or are you taking a private sector or a public sector mindset? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the well, question. What's happening like a military mindset you require a military? No, I, I, I think I'm... ...mentality, because not everybody understands what it is to go out and put themselves in a position to go head-to-head -head and communicate all night with Islamic terrorists. Yeah, I'm not saying go head-to-head, -head, sir. I'm, I'm saying participate in the conversation. First, you take the mindset, the military mindset, in this matter... From, from, a, from an OPSEC perspective? Uh, I think that there are, there are very good ways to have a conversation from a social perspective, not a targeting perspective. That was my argument at the beginning of this is a social conversation. Uh, so I, no. No, I think that this is a human rights analogous conversation that needs to be had in the online environment. And the only people that are doing this historically are those in the military and the government. And, and we're bad at it. That's, that's my opinion. Yes, sir. So, can I go to talk to you a little bit about some success that you've had with the Darkest Program X? Do you see anything on that? I'm trying to track some of the stuff in the I'm not familiar with that. No, nope. thank you. Yes, sir. I'm a little concerned about the ramifications of what you're suggesting. Um, the lack of, um, in the absence of due process, who becomes the authority to categorize who is bad? What is your definition of the type? Yeah, so he's, he's saying he's concerned about my uh, ramifications of what I'm suggesting and who becomes the authority on what's bad. And, uh, 
great, great point and great question. And uh, towards the, to, to me, this conversation is not to debate uh, freedom of religion, freedom of speech. Speech. I, I think that there are there are very few people that would argue with a uh, person that is encouraging the sharing of beheading information and attack on uh, Western people, Western facilities. That's my. That's the definition to me. Very in a very black and white. What's bad? Yeah, and, and, and I, I, I think that... To me, this is about ISIL. I'm not, I'm not trying to be the judge and jury. Uh, why, how does it sound like that? I'm, I, you're, you're extrapolating what I'm suggesting, like steps two through ten. Right, yeah. That's what my concern is ramification of what you're suggesting. It kind of seems like a mob mentality. No, I, well, I, I would say that to compete with the mob mentality that, that we're fighting right now, uh, I think that I'm, I'm trying to say that it's very obvious to, to me when I look at Shami Witness, who is an Indian blogger, and he tweets about every kind of social aspect of the Islamic State from afar, and we just watch that happen. And it's very obvious to me when they're sharing beheading videos of, you know, pilot or this. That's a black and white thing. Yeah, yeah. I, and I, like I, I think that this is a healthy debate, by the way, um, and I think that's one that this community really, really can participate in very effectively. Um, so I, I don't, um, I don't mind the, the slingshots at all. I, I, in fact, appreciate them, and I think that we can get to problem solving. Yeah. Awesome question. Yeah. How, how do you? The, the question was, how would we measure effectiveness of like input into this conversation after a year's time? Have we had any effect? Um, great question. Uh, I, I, I think that it would be something that I, same to the technology that we have to use, I think that it would be dynamic and iterative. Um, but I don't know. And uh, I'm, I'm really comfortable saying that. Um, and, and when I you know, said the, the why ISIL, I think that we've got a couple of good years of experience on you know, these are different approaches we've taken and it hasn't worked. So maybe it's time. Maybe it's time to try something different. You know. Um, so I don't know. Good question. Yes, in the back. So I, I think I followed your question of, hey, how could I, from 5,000 miles away, be a, 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 an authoritative or informed voice when it's probably a, a little bit more of a local problem? Is that fair? Yeah. I, I, uh, I agree with you. I, 
I would, would I think that this needs to snowball, and it, this can't just be a Tim good idea fairy. It needs to get you know interpretation from other people on dude, this is stupid because you know it needs to be it needs to be local. It needs to be. I think this needs to grow into something that's larger than just this room and just Twitter. And you know, it, my point is is that uh, the information com- component of this movement is one of the most significant and there are concerns about engaging with bad people there are concerns about how you do it from an informed standpoint but for us to you know Jason ended with for the triumph of, e- of, of evil good men can do nothing and there are a lot of good folks in the government and, and it, normal populations doing their best here but again I, this is a snowball that hasn't stopped hasn't stopped rolling too much in the last couple of years Yes. Uh, so you talked about the possibility of crowdsourcing this uh, evaluation engine you're talking about. I think I, you said that in this conversation. Do you want to throw your book on our GitHub or something? Yeah, I, th- I think we would be. Yeah, I think I'd, I want I want to talk to people about it, but yeah, I think that we we'd head in that direction. Yeah. Yes, sir. Excuse me? Yeah, the, to elaborate on a little bit about what the classifiers are. Yeah, I think, I, um, what are we as a researchers using for the classifiers? I think it's some of the stuff that I was responding to this gentleman with. And to, to, we're trying to be a very black and white, uh, so there's, there's very few opportunities to get it wrong in the wrong direction. It, very black and white of, this is a published account, you know, not just interpreted by me, but by Al Hayat. Uh, it's a very, it's a published account talking about published things. So from a black and white standpoint. I'm having a hard time hearing you, sir. When we built it, when we built the test set, the, so the baseline library, that was us manually researching Twitter lists and known publishers and and uh, pronounced and pulling those attributes and classifying according to that Scikit Learn machine, the Python machine learning. Yeah. So that was a manual, that was a human thing on the first side of this. Okay? Yes, sir. What's the bigger role of this in terms of not just ISIS or ISIL, but in terms of terminology as a whole, shining down different groups of people? What's the bigger role of this in, with criminology in, in general? Yeah, as a I'm not. I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting. Uh, I'm suggesting just the opposite. That this is a. This is a people thing, not a government thing. Sure, but I, but again, this is this is uh, a month worth of open source code and some ideas. You know, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot smarter people than me thinking about that stuff. Yes, sir.
first answer is yes. Um, and again, pulling it back into, I'm not suggesting targeting. I'm not suggesting hunting and pecking. I'm suggesting pay attention to the conversation and, and potentially participate in it. That's all. Is that it? Thank you.